Welcome back to Breaking Spines, the miscellaneous book review show for reviewing miscellaneous books. Now, most of the books I've covered on this show have been random finds at thrift stores, things I had never heard about and might never have read if I wasn't putting these challenges on myself. But that's not the only way I discover books. Sometimes I learn about an interesting book while researching one of these videos and pick up a cheap used copy on the Amazon Marketplace. Such is the case with today's find, which I learned about while looking up the works that influenced the Silent Hill series. It would seem that this novel had some influence on Silent Hill 4 The Room, so you know I had to check it out. This is Coin Locker Babies by Ryu Murakami, originally published in Japan in 1980, with the English translation published in 1995. This book tells the story of two young men, Hashi and Kiku. Both were born in 1972 and, completely independent of each other, were both abandoned as babies inside coin lockers in a Tokyo train station. Raised together in an orphanage and both adopted by the same family, the two now brothers grew up on a small island, where they spent most of their days exploring an abandoned town, whose only occupants are a pack of wild dogs and a mysterious man who rides around on a motorcycle and looks a little like Jesus Christ. This man tells them of Detura, a classified government substance that's said to drive people into an insane rage, which intrigues Kiku, who sees very little of worth in the world. Kiku grows up to be a pole vaulter, while Hashi runs away in search of a sound from his youth, a sound he can't quite place. And he learns so much about sound in the process that he becomes a hypnotic singer, and eventually a wild bisexual pop star. Kiku, meanwhile, hooks up with a young model named Animone, who has converted her apartment into a swamp to house her pet crocodile. And that's when we get to the weird parts. Okay, so it's clear that Coin Locker Babies doesn't lend itself easily to a plot synopsis, which is in part because of how bonkers the whole thing is, and in part because of its structure. I would almost go so far as to call it a short story collection, even though it has a consistent cast of characters moving towards consistent goals. Each chapter feels self-contained. They don't break on cliffhangers, they each have their own crescendos, gradual rising actions and climaxes. As an experiment, I reread a handful of random chapters out of order, and they all worked as their own little self-contained pieces. The book has no qualms stepping away from the main plot to explore some side characters, show us what people are reading. One chapter is just a pamphlet somebody gives Kiku. Each chapter is usually centered on around one central image or idea, sometimes just an aesthetic, just so long as every chapter somehow jumps out and sticks to you like a sick sneeze. Sure, that sounds gross, but it's tame compared to some of the stuff this book gets up to. Ever tried to bring a crocodile along for a road trip? It's not pretty. I was a little worried when approaching this book, as I am with any piece of foreign media, because I tend to have little niggling doubts about my understanding of the work. Do I have enough understanding of the history and culture surrounding it to get the intended message? Is the translation accurate, not just in literal meaning, but in capturing the intended subtleties of the work? Well, this translation's been out for 20 years and nobody's complained, so I have to assume it's good. As for the ideas behind this book, there's a lot to unpack. First off, mothers leaving newborn infants in coin lockers was actually a thing that was happening in Japan and China to an alarming degree. Between 1980 and 1990, there were 191 reported cases of dead babies found in coin lockers. I mean, that's nuts, right? For many people, that would be the peak of madness. But this book seems to suggest, what if it was just the beginning of madness? Ryu Murakami, who is best known in the States as the author of Audition, also known as, oh dear god, no! <clears throat> Before getting into writing, Murakami was a rock drummer, an independent film director, and had spent three months under house arrest for barricading the rooftop of his school. So it's not hard to see him evoking themes of youthful rebellion in his work, and in fact that appears to be a reoccurring element in most of his work to this day. From what little I've read, Murakami is very interested in provoking young people into questioning authority and putting less value on economic expansion, which he feels Japan took on as a substitute to an actual cultural identity. But at the same time, these characters aren't heroes. They're angry and they have no productive outlet for that anger. They're not punk rock anarchists because that would involve actually engaging with the political realm. They're not interested in the system. They just have a list of people and things that upset them personally and that they want to see completely destroyed. 
but irony of ironies, our two protagonists become heroes of sorts in the eyes of the public. The entertainment industry plays a major role in the book. We have Hashi becoming a major pop star in his interactions with his record label, who he literally has to sleep with. It gets kind of kooky in a this is Spinal Tap kind of way. Kiku becomes a celebrity in his own right after committing a rather public crime. I won't spoil it here, but he does something rather violent in front of news cameras. Once his story of being a coin locker baby gets out, he's turned into a sympathetic character by the media, which gets him a lighter sentence in prison. The media glorifies truly harmful personalities like that. The book kind of weaves back and forth between the comedy of the absurd and truly disturbing imagery. The first sentence acts as a litmus test to see if you can handle what this book is going to throw at you. I won't repeat it here, but it involves infant genitals. Bodily fluids are ever present. There's no such thing as normal everyday sex. Nobody dies peacefully. This is a book that refuses to allow you to get comfortable with it. It's not shock media, or at least not only shock media. Murakami has legitimate themes and ideas here, but it's hard to imagine most people I know really getting into this. It even made me uncomfortable at times, and not in a Victoria Holt, I fell in love with my rapist way, but in a genuine get under my skin and feel bad about my gross organic mass I call an existence way. But that's why I have to recommend this book, because it's such a singularly unique experience, at least for myself. It's a challenging and disturbing book that I would not begrudge anyone for not completing, but it's challenging and disturbing in a very thought out, politically charged way. I realize this episode of Breaking Spines is a little shorter than most, and I'm leaving a lot of details vague. Part of that is to not spoil the sheer amount of shock value moments contained here, the other being that there's a lot of dense details here that this book would be better served as a series of chapter by chapter analysis videos, which I think would be fun to do if I believed for a second that any of you guys would watch it. This is actually the first episode of Breaking Spines where I had writer's block. I just froze up on how I should even approach a book like this. So would I recommend Coin Locker Babies? Yes, yes I would. But would you recommend Coin Locker Babies? Probably not. Oh, and the whole connection to Silent Hill 4? Nothing terribly direct, just the idea of an abandoned child becoming a destructive force. It's not even an infant left in a coin locker, just abandoned in general. Silent Hill games do tend to work on disturbing imagery, but the giant lady head is the only thing that comes close to this book's level. You know, now I'm kind of anxious uh, for uh, Ryu Murakami to write a Silent Hill game. Now, I want to try and make this channel more interactive, so I'm going to try something here, at least for the next couple of episodes of Breaking Spines. See how well it takes. You, yes you, gentle viewer, will get to vote on what book I talk about next on Breaking Spines. You won't get to know which books you're voting for, because being surprised by books you've never heard of is kind of the whole idea behind this show, but you will get to vote on what kind of book I'll review next. So to start us off, let's pick genres I have yet to cover on this show. We could do a western, a harlequin romance, or a book of poetry. Ooh. Vote on which kind of book you'd like to see reviewed in the comments, and we'll see where this takes us. Thank you for watching, and keep on breaking spines.